I have the privilege of working as an environmental consultant, which means that I get to spend the majority of my days working with organizations to help them progress their sustainability objectives, as well as my own. But my career actually started in grassroots conservation. I was born and raised in South Africa, and I had an incredible and privileged upbringing in a family of fishermen and grain, game rangers. Whilst I spent time in school in Johannesburg, I still spent the majority of my youth out in the bush or in the ocean in the depths of Africa's wilderness. In fact, my earliest career aspiration was to grow up to be a mermaid. Truthfully, <laughs> it still is. But all I knew was that as long as I could work in the wild with the wild, then I would have purpose and I would be happy. Because of my upbringing, I have been able to experience a number of different types of conservation work from a sea life sanctuary where I looked after seal, pups, penguins, and otters, to a wild bird rescue where I helped care for some of South Africa's most critically endangered species, to the Natal Sharks Board where I spent a summer researching shark attacks in Africa to contribute to global conservation research. And no, we did not swim in the ocean that year. And finally, even some work experience in agriculture, where I learned how important ecosystem management was for a sustainable food supply. At the age of 14, following a violent home invasion, my family immigrated to the UK, and things began to look a little different. Now, truthfully, I actually feel that my immigrant status and starting a new life in a new country at such a formative age alongside the diversity of work experience I've been fortunate enough to experience, gives me a very clear perspective about the relationship between people and the environment. Having grown up in a developing country and then growing up again in a technically developed one. Being so close to nature really shaped my understanding of how ecosystems work, the food web, the delicate balance of life, the idea that every species, including humans, has a role to play in maintaining the balance of one living planet. So here's the absolute foundation of what I know. We are all mutually dependent on each other. As Mufasa so eloquently put it, you need to understand and respect all the creatures. Everything you see exists in a delicate balance of life. From the crawling ant to the leaping antelope, we are all connected in the great circle of life. So we need to begin by understanding our planet differently. The Earth is alive. It is functioning as one living organism, with all the species, habitats, and ecosystems playing a critical role in maintaining the conditions for life to not only survive, but to thrive in an otherwise hostile universe. Nature provides everything we need as ecosystem services. Clean air, clean food, clean water, and somewhere safe to live. These basic needs, as Maslow pointed out, are the foundations of human existence. Yet they are also under threat because of our actions. The disruption of natural systems affects us all. But in countries like South Africa, those effects are felt more acutely. For example, climate change leads to environmental degradation. Rising temperatures and more extreme weather events result in a loss of life and land. This directly impacts food security, causing job losses and increasing poverty levels. As poverty rises, Access to healthcare, education, and other essential services diminish. Poverty then fuels crime, as individuals and families struggle to meet their basic needs. Increased crime further destabilizes communities, making them less attractive for investment, which only widens the income gap between those who can afford to leave those areas and those who cannot. Wars and conflicts often emerge from these points. Competition for scarce resources, political instability and social unrest 
can lead to violence and large-scale displacement of populations. These conflicts further degrade the environment and disrupt economic activity, creating a vicious cycle that seems impossible to break. Oh, and have you heard about load shedding? Every day, for at least two hours, but sometimes up to eight, the energy providers pick a corner of the country and they turn off the lights. Every day, every house, business, school, hospital, care home just doesn't have electricity because the system cannot meet demand. There isn't enough to go around. For over 10 years, people have just accepted this as a part of everyday life. When there's not enough, inconvenience and sacrifice become the norm. And it's not just developing countries anymore. From severe weather events, an increase in flooding and severity of storms here in the UK, limited product options, which means we can't always get what we want when we want, including food, essentials, medicines, clothing, as well as luxuries. Oh, and everything's getting really, really expensive. We are all competing for resources. And the simple truth is, there just isn't enough to go around. Climate change is nature crying for balance. She's been balancing ecosystems for millions of years. But right now, she's out of sync, like a body with a fever. It's the purest principles of biology, physics, and chemistry that keep us alive. What difference does 1.5 degrees make? Well, it's exactly like a fever for us. It tells us we're sick. Anything much higher than 2 degrees, your organs could start shutting down. You could be sick enough to die. Nature is telling us that she needs time to heal, space to regenerate, and we need to start listening to her, for her survival as well as ours. So how do we translate these lessons into action? We're trying to fix the damage and find a route to a sustainable destination, one where people, planet, and profit are equal and equitable what we call the triple bottom line of sustainability, with peace, justice, health, and well-being for all eight billion of us and Mother Nature. And whilst equity is certainly dest the destination, it's clear that it is not where we are currently. Scientific evidence continues to demonstrate that economic progress is putting an unsustainable burden on our physical environment. So this makes me think that maybe they shouldn't be equal right now anyway. I truthfully believe that the route to true triple bottom line sustainability must take a nature first perspective. Making Mother Earth the primary consideration in achieving or getting to that destination of sustainability. Because what I know from my upbringing in South Africa is this simple truth. Out of strong environments, strong communities are built. And out of strong communities, strong businesses, governments, and institutes are built. When people are fighting for the basics of clean air, clean food, and clean water, then why would any of the other stuff even matter? Remember Maslow? Now, I appreciate that this might seem a little overwhelming, but I think that a nature-first solution isn't actually that complicated. The most widely accepted definition of sustainable development towards the destination of sustainability is about meeting the needs of people now and in the future whilst getting back within environmental limits. In simple terms, that means we need to start acting in harmony with nature, considering her needs for health and balance at the heart of every decision that we make. Overconsumption, resource use, and the associated volumes of waste and pollution are degrading the environmental systems on which we all depend. 
Rebalancing the planet by giving her space and time to heal is an undoubtedly complicated task. But I believe wholeheartedly the collective individual action is the solution. There are eight billion of us. If we all do one thing differently, that could be eight billion better decisions for nature. Research shows that the consumption behaviors of households accounts for up to 72% of global carbon emissions. Therefore, consumers are key actors in helping us stay below that 1.5 degree mark agreed at the Paris Agreement. Now, this is not to downplay the role of governments and organizations, but more to indicate that collectively we have greater levels of power and influence to really affect change. So how do we do that? Well, to buy or not to buy? That is the question. At the very heart of protecting nature, we need to rethink our consumption. First, we need to recognize and accept that there isn't enough to go around, especially at the rates that we are consuming. Our planet's capacity is limited. We're taking too much, too fast, and she needs time to heal. Every time you buy something, ask yourself if you really need it. Deciding to consume less will ultimately reduce the pressure on nature's already depleted resources, giving her back all the energy and nutrients that she needs to fight this global warming infection and give her time to recover so that she can find the balance to sustain life as we know it. But we've heard this all before, right? It's everywhere. Reduce, reuse, recycle. I think we miss reduce. It really is the number one action. Just stop buying stuff you don't need. But when you do have to buy stuff you do need, make better buying decisions. Buy from sustainable materials, buy items that are built to last, that will hold maximum value from those precious resources for as long as possible because not manufacturing will also reduce the amounts of waste and pollution that are currently choking this planet while she tries to fight this infection. Your buying choices really matter. Be more critical and demand that nature is considered as a stakeholder from the organizations that you choose to engage with. When you consume less and demand better, businesses and governments will listen. And finally, my favorite R. This is climate action through rewilding. Now, reducing carbon emissions alone will not be enough to keep us below that 1.5 degree centigrade mark. Large volumes of carbon also need to be removed from the atmosphere. Rewilding and natural climate-based solutions could provide over a third of the greenhouse gas mitigation required between now and 2030. Giving nature space to heal will not only restore our air, soil, and water, but by the very balance of nature, it will help her to cool down the planet. The UK is actually one of the most nature-poor countries in the world coming 189th out of 218 in the latest State of Nature report. But even the tiniest of spaces can be more biodiverse. If we all do our bit in our own back gardens and backyards, our joined efforts could have a massive potential positive effect on the environment. Again, collective individual action that connects this one living planet. So literally, go freaking wild. <laughs> Plant trees, flowers, weeds, leaf piles, bug hotels. You cannot go wrong. Avoid chemicals and leave nature to find her balance. And you'll be amazed at what starts to turn up in your garden. Remember what nature did during COVID when we all stopped. So here's where we land. 
We've seen the damage caused by the way things are, and there is a lot of talk out there. We feel the effects, whether it's climate change, resource scarcity, or economic instability. But we, as individuals, as consumers, we have a choice about the way that we do life and business. If each of us can make a different decision, consume less, reuse more, rewild nature, and demand better from the organizations we engage with, we could make a big difference. These may seem like small steps, but when taken together, they have the potential for global impact. Out of strong environments, strong communities are built. And out of strong communities, strong businesses, governments, and institutes are built. A rebalanced and thriving Earth is possible, but only if we take a nature-first perspective approach putting the health of the planet at the core of every decision we make. Nature knows how to heal. We just need to give her some time and space to do so. And right now, nature is screaming at us. The question is, are you listening? <laughs>